This is hardware transactional memory. Um, and it's a fun story, uh, in part because a lot of really smart people believed it would really save the world, and in part because a whole lot of money was spent, and I was right smack dab in the middle of it. Um, and so before I go any further, I guess I'd want to go and just do like the, the five second audience poll of sort of what's your knowledge, like you're here for some reason or another, what's your knowledge of, of what I mean by hardware transactional memory in like 10 seconds or less? I know what it is, I've heard the term, I thought it was cool, it's in Intel or not. Like, like go down, say so start with you, like, like five seconds. No name, just what do you know? Okay, something like CAS, but there's something at the level of the hardware itself. So that's actually a really good answer. That? Okay. Good. You heard the term. That's Don't know what it means. Okay, we'll, we'll fix that in a minute. How about you? Uh, I read a couple of articles about it. So uh, that's all. Okay, yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, I think I think I got what I wanted. Do you want to answer? Uh, okay, oh. yeah, I know what the uh, system is. We are developing high-frequency trading software. That's why I'm interested in anything you are going to tell. <laughs> okay, I only kind of got that over the echoes. Okay, I think I think we're good. Um, so so let me let me do my usual ten seconds on myself here. Uh, I'm Cliff Click. I've been uh, second in Japan in a lot of different startups. Um, I've been in startups for more than 15 years. I've been coding since I was a kid. I've been building compilers for more than 40 years. I've been doing distributed computation for more than 35. I've been doing OSs and device drivers and high performance computing and, and hotspot for a very, very, very long time. I did the core JIT in the Java virtual machine, which is still in use today. It runs on a billion servers a thousand times a day, a thousand times every time a process launches. Low latency G, custom Java hardware. We're going to get into the custom Java hardware here in a second. Um, lots and lots and lots of stuff. And, uh, and, and of course, I do hundreds of public talks. So uh, I'm all good to do these talks. And I enjoy the audience feedback and interaction, which is why I started that way. So if you have a question, feel free to stop me in the middle of the talk and raise your hand, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer as fast as best I can. OK. Spoiler, hardware transactional memory doesn't work. And by work, I mean it won't allow serious parallel execution of sort of random junk Java code. Um, and for reasons that are obvious in hindsight, but were not obvious at the time going into it. And uh, you could definitely have a good impact in sort of small library use cases, carefully hand-tuned code. Um, these might show up in OSs for context switch behavior or in codecs for various kinds of libraries, but they're not a general purpose solution for letting you run things in parallel that aren't obviously been carefully set to be parallel in the first place. And the industry found other solutions to running big parallel workloads, mostly clusters and microservices. So Hadoop style clusters and microservices are what people do for big parallel execution these days. Um, this is a story that happens before that change in the market happened. It was happening, but it wasn't an obvious answer yet. So Azul started in 2002. Our target was to sell to big businesses running big Java, usually some sort of portals or web servers. And big parallel Java was just conceived, perceived to be much easier than distributed computing. Distributed computing adds an extra layer of indirection that makes it more difficult to talk about Two, two guys talk to each other over just standard parallel computing. And so in this world, thread pools and work lists are very common. I think these days you'll see a lot of fork joins now baked in the JDK. Back then, fork join was brand new or not even there and was coming along. And people were ma hand managing thread pools. GC pause is a big issue. There's a lot of locking going on, um, especially around caches. So we're going to do a big effort for a big gain, and that means custom hardware. So what is in that big gain? Well, big core count. So a, a dedicated CPU for every task, every lambda, every runnable, every little thing you can execute. Lots of cores left over to run garbage collection, to run jitting, to run I.O., where you might have to hot spin on network byte buffers and the like. And so there have to be cores, and lots of them, and that means they're simple, but they're more, uh, they're definitely better off than the GPUs of that era. These are serious computing cores, um, not sort of cut, and, cut down ones like GPUs. So three address risk chips, 64-bit three address risk chips. 
They have smaller caches than an x86 and a lower, lower frequency. There's a couple extra hardware instructions to go uh, uh, accelerate things that we think are going to use a lot of. One of them, the low latency GC, lives on in Azul's current business model. I'll talk more about that later, just a little tiny bit. But there was a piece of hardware to make those go, that go faster. There was other uh, pieces of hardware. And then there was the hardware transactional memory for letting us run uh, uh, legal, correct Java code in parallel through a lock at the same time. And, and then you know, a decade later, Intel Haswell starts showing up with a little bit of HTM hardware. So what worked well? Um, well, the irregular thread parallel workloads, we, we found that we could actually run them in parallel fairly damn well. So uh, hardware was amazingly good at running big web portals. The GC also worked fabulously well. Uh, at that era, we would handle on a terabyte live heap 40 gigs allocation a second with the max pulse and the low millisecond range, which you can't hardly get out of an x86 from Oracle these days using the best GC they have. The current Azul collector has this down to the low microsecond range. These are max pause, not average pause, but average to average approaches the max pretty damn closely in this kind of scenario. Um, all our extra hardware bits all ended up working in the end. We have this always on JVM profiling that would make people cry if they saw it even today. 24-7 uh, uh, always on profiling with cheap web browser interface to get at all the stats you'd ever want out of a profiler. It's all the stats the JVM uses to internally optimize itself. Still can't get that out today. It sucks. Um, ah, moving on. So the expected use case is we're going to have a lot of parallel worker threads doing sort of semi-unrelated tasks. And uh, in particular, we were all happy to go hit like Black Friday workloads for big, big name retailers you've all heard of. Bunch of them bought a Zul gear. It worked totally fabulous on Black Friday, 100x scaling. And then you know two days later, the, the load wore off. It would run like a champ through the whole thing. You expect lots of locking and synchronization around your shared infrastructure, especially your caches. From there, you expect a lot of useless contention. Why? Because everyone has to use a lock. And so you get locking of readers against the rare writer, but actually the readers also lock, so they block each other. So just multiple people reaching out to the same cache at the same time. No one's updating the cache. Everyone's hitting in the cache. They're still blocking each other. Also, people have trouble debugging concurrent code. And one of the easy fixes for concurrent code is to not be concurrent. And so they throw a lot of junk locks in. They're not really sure, but they threw enough locks in, the bug went away, and they're like, woohoo, we're done, right? So you get a lot of junk locks that um, cause contention for no good reason other than at some point someone thought it might have fixed a bug, and maybe it did or it didn't. So we're hoping that the hardware transactional memory will allow us to do parallel Java execution through locks. Multiple threads, both having the lock, both running in the code at the same time, and be correct about it. So the poster child case here is hash map. Shared large hash map as a cache. Mostly reads, say 95, 99% readers. 1% writers are going to be updating rarely. The, the readers are going to be obviously blocked by a rare writer. But the readers are blocking each other because you're using the synchronized keyword. And the HTML will allow access at least where the writer and the readers are not uh, in different parts of the table. So parallel access without lock-free computing. This is not Java uh, uh, concurrent utils you know, non-blocking. This is standard everyday synchronized. Java locks, so we have to talk about that. So the goal of the hardware is to accelerate Java locks. So what's in a Java lock? Well, it's well accelerated in software already. And there are three sort of major performance domains here. There's the, it's not contended, and we take a CAS, and somebody in the audience at least knows what a CAS is. It's uh, uh, the unit of atomic update in all modern processors. It's the one instruction you build all of your atomicities from. And if this didn't work, you try spinning. What does that mean? You just try the lock again, 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 again. Well, you give up after a while. But often this works if the contention is light. There are a couple threads they are trying to get in, but they're not often hitting each other. One guy just spins a little bit, and then he gets it. And then heavy contention is where you give it up and you block. You tried for a while. It didn't work. You go to the OS and say, hey, put me to sleep until this lock gets free. And the OS puts you to sleep. And this is a heavyweight operation. This is uh, 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 you know, full context switch in and out. It's not a cheap thing. Late in life, a fourth domain showed up, bias locking. And this would be where there was no contention, 
and your CAS instruction worked every time, and you did it every time. You locked and unlocked and locked and unlocked and locked and unlocked and a million times in a row, never failed, so they bias it. And the biasing just means I pre-lock it, I hold on to the lock, even when I was supposed to unlock it, I don't bother, and then the JIT even knows this is going on and doesn't bother to do locking uh, correctness at the locking boundaries, and he makes a bunch of cheating that he can do and you go much faster, except if somebody else actually does want the lock, it's really expensive to get it back, and uh, fun stuff when it works. So Azul had bias locking ahead of Sun by about a decade, including the much cheaper return when you get it right. Um, for the no contention case, the Azul CAS at that time could hit in your L1 cache. Very unusual. No other processor did it for a decade. Um, eventually, x86 gets there in 2012. Up until 2012, a, a successful lock acquire on Java required a CAS instruction, which took the full cost of main memory, which is about 300 clock cycles on a four-wide issue machine. It was 1,000 clocks lost on a successful acquire with no other contention. After here, it would hit in your L2, and Intel was like 10 clocks, but a much faster clock than the L1 here, so about the same time-wise. Um, light contentions, the same. Heavy contention would be is almost the same, except Azul put fair locks in the OS, because we were totally expecting a huge thread count. So Azul would, have, would be able to well run about 1,000 cores and 100,000 runnable threads. So not just threads that are created and blocked, but threads that are actually running and runnable. Azul would totally give them fair locking treatment with good efficiency. You do that in any other modern OS, the OS will, will basically starve everyone else out. A couple of guys win, and everyone else will starve. And I can, it's easy to demo. It's fine. I actually can't usually get 100,000 threads if you run out of memory, but you can do this with 10,000. OK, so the hardware transactional memory is targeted in here. You're past the light. The spinning didn't work. But you don't want to block in the OS yet. Try the HTM. Hardware transactional memory, a Java lock in parallel. So you're going to let a set of memory operations to happen atomically. So that's in a transaction, right? That's what it means. So two or more threads are going to run in the same code, but they're either only reading or they're writing to unrelated from what the readers are reading. And then you're going to let that happen at the same time. And you're going to use the HTM to guard it. And you'll abort if there's actually a conflict but you can detect correctness. So that as we'll both come to the lock, they'll both say, I'm taking this lock at the same time. And then they'll both walk through it in parallel in the same lock. Usually, you know, one's a little ahead of the other, whatever. But you have a 1,000 of them coming through. Um, and at the end, you'll say, no one else saw what I did, so it was atomic. That's the goal. So how is it implemented? Well, it's your L1 decache. So your L1 on an Azul box is pretty small because we had so many processors. You're not so much cache. 512 lines of 32 bytes each, and only a four-way associative. Compare that to an x86 these days is 64K of, uh, I don't know how long the line is. They're a little longer, maybe, an eight-way associative. So it's a substantially smaller L1. But your L1 controls your visibility to all your other cores. Things you write to memory start in your L1. And until they get out of your L1 to memory, no one else knows that you wrote, right? So what's in my L1 is not visible to anyone else until it leaves my L1. So I'm going to store my transactional updates, my writes, in my L1. And if I abort, I'm going to invalidate them. And they'll never leave my L1. No one else can know that I've written to memory. They cannot see it because it's never hit any piece of memory that they have access to, right? It hit my private L1 only. But if I succeed, then I'll let those lines escape my cache and go to main memory, and other people will see that I wrote to memory, right? So that's the goal here. To make that work, you need an extra bit per line. It's not very expensive to track whether a line's been touched uh, in the transaction or not. So in theory, my transactions can get as large as my cache, 16 kilobytes. Um, I'm just going to mark the lines as a transaction bit as I run through the transaction. And as long as I don't lose a line, as long as I don't have to evict a line out, no one knows I'm touching lines or not. And then it will have to be known as atomic when I'm done. The Java lock will use the HTM. Uncontented locks will obviously attempt a CAS. Heavy contented locks will block. Everyone else, hardware transactional memory first. 
So the, the basic stepping, uh, steps are you attempt to acquire with a CAS. The CAS has failed. You check for inflated lock. You inflate as needed. You check for contention where the heuristic says give it up and go away. Otherwise, you bump some counters. You flip a hardware bit that says the transaction has started. And now every line the core touches is marked as a transactional line. And you run Java code until you unlock or the L1 tries to throw out a line. And there are a bunch of reasons he might throw out a line. And the usual one is, is somebody else wants that line because they are writing it, and you've read it. Or they are reading it, and you wrote it. The unlock, however, is just pretty easy. It's you quit marking. You clear all those bits, and you're just done. So the commit is like totally cheap. I'm going to I'm clear my bits, and I'm done. Carry on. Lock worked. It was atomic. No one knows what lines I touched. Now I'll let them see what lines I touched. But when I did it, they couldn't tell, so it was atomic. But if I want to lose a line, instead of losing it, the hardware will throw an interrupt at me. And I'll jump to piece of software code. Transaction has stopped. All the dirty lines, and the mar I'm sorry, all the marked lines now get marked invalid. I, I clear the, the data on the line. It got modified by the processor. I don't know what the correct answer is. I'm going to act as if nothing ever happened. So I'm just going to clear the data on the line. No writing it back. And then I'm going to retry on software, which the software may choose to transact again. That's a spin loop on the transaction level. Spin loop correctly. A CAS may work. Or I might bail to the OS. The heuristics decide where to go if you retry. So we're going to get a little more detail on an example of a synchronized shared hash map. There can be some active readers, a writer is an unrelated part of the table. Everyone wants to run concurrently. And I have a standard 64-bit layout. The Azul layout was a little different because we squoze the mark and the class word into one word. But it's roughly the same. So I have a hash map somewhere in memory. There's a mark and a class, a point of the table, a size field, a mod field, an entry set, a load factor, some pad, whatever. The table is just a Java array of objects. So it's a standard Java object. It has an address, so it has a mark and a class, has a length, pad, and then 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, a few hundred thousand, how many entries in the hash table? Those are hash table entries. Those all point to entry objects. And an entry object is a mark and class and a key to value and an X pointer, because it maybe it's a linked list, which if your table's working well, the list is always null. So that's something what you're looking at when you're trying to walk through a hash table. And every thread wants to lock, load the top level map, Load the map's table address, load the length for the mod function and for the range check. You're going to have a key. You're going to have to load a hash code, which maybe it's a field load or a complicated function, whatever hash code does. You're going to have to index to the table, do an array lookup, load an entry. From the entry, get the key. Compare the key for pointer equals. Do a dot equals if that fails. Then you're going to change values or whatever, and then you're unlocking. Wow, it's a lot of stuff in a hash table lookup, much more than you might think. So I'm going to start by looking at the lock, seeing it's been flagged in the header for HTM. I'm going to grab a table. I want to go grab the length and the index and the hash and find correct entry. And, and meanwhile, there's a thread over here, too, who wants to start writing in a hash map. Now we're going to get fun for a second. So here's my, here's my two cores with a shared memory. And I'm going to show some, some stuff in here to help you understand what's going on. But then it won't really matter. It's just for fun. There's tables in my caches and tables in my main memory. Here's my map base. It has a mark and a class and a table pointer to here. And there's some padding bits and an entry object and a load factor. Not an entry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, um, the other thing in there on a load factor. There's some table bits, which are mark and a class and a length. And then here's entry object 0, 1, 2, 3. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, however big my table is. That's main memory. Here's some of those lines replicated up here with invalid or shared according to whether another processor can see it or not. And I have a MESI protocol in the middle. And it's all kind of a big lie. In reality, of course, there are many cache layers. And each layer is 10 times slower and 10 times bigger than the one before it. But we're mostly going to play in our L1, so it doesn't really matter. The data is replicated in multiple places. Here's tab plus 0, tab plus 0, tab plus 0. That's shared around. A lot of people have a copy of that. But some other stuff, only one or the other has a copy of, and it's not actually present everywhere. And where it is a copy in your cache, it's usually replicated in memory, unless you've modified it and haven't written it back. And then it's modified in your cache, but not in memory. 
And memory itself is a complicated beast doing all kinds of fun things. This is my starting slides. I'm going to show you how to do a data race, why, uh, why data races happen, but won't be necessary here. We're going to be a little bit simpler. So there's something going on here where both threads jump in and say, hey, can I use HTM? Load the map header to the mark word. From the mark word, do a bit test. Is HTM OK? Somewhere in here, I go ask for the map header word, which has to go to memory and ask for it, or tell the other caches, evict your line if you have it. And they both get a copy marked as share. That's the S. And they can go send the bits back saying, hey, HTM. And the answer is, well, yes, do it. So we flip our hardware a bit, and we're going to start our HTM on it. And I'm going to reset my thing on the left and look again. Everyone grabs the header word in case it gets modified by somebody, and that'll cause them to lose their line and abort the transaction. And so the map bits come back. And then they say, oh, we have a key, key one, key two. Let's go get key plus hash. And no one has a copy. They say, evict each other. If you had a copy, they don't. No big deal. Hash values come back. Go get me my map plus 16. That's the entry of the table. So they both say, go get me the table. Go get me the length out of the table. And again, the length is coming back. And see, after a while, you can see these x's. That's where I've marked them for a transaction. So we both agree that if either the map header word or the table head word changes, we'll abort. But it hasn't happened yet. And so the array length comes back. I then mod for the hash. I then do the math. Where did the math go? There it goes. That says, you know, array math. Oh, I want table plus 64. I want table plus 32 because it fit well on my little demo here. Um, they pick different entries in the hash table because they're talking to different things. One's going to read, one's going to write, but they're different lines. So they both say, go to table at hash and load the entry object. After they try to evict on each other for those lines, neither of them has it. It's all good. So they get their entry object back, which they then go get the offset for key one or key two. And then they have to decide that they want the, where do they go here? Get the key out of the entry object field for them both, which is entry plus whatever the correct offset is for the key, which then comes back, you're going to compare with, and loads into your cache. I have entry one, you have entry two. I have a mark and a class and a key and a value, and it's transactional, and you have the same thing. And then I write, so this becomes V prime, and entry two has been modified, and the line is marked modified, and I had to invalidate over here with the bang. That means I modified, you must give it up. I don't have it. Otherwise, you have to give up entry one, which you don't have. And we decided at the end no one had boarded a line, so we can commit. As part of commit, we clear all the X bits. Those operations were atomic. That means they were not seen by the other guy. No one saw what the other guy wrote, which is in particular only this one word here was written. Entry plus two is not in this guy's cache. He is unaware of the modification. So this was a safe transaction. OK, that was a fun example, but it's too simple. I showed four cache lines with six loads and an extra load store. But you have to do more if your hash code has something more complicated to it. And you have to do more if you have to call a dot equals call that's more complicated. And you have to reprobe even a little bit. You're going to touch a whole other set of lines. And you're going to end up touching the mod count and concurrent, check for concurrent modification exception as well. And you probably check the load factor size as well. Um, so the typical successfully read-only hash map is about 15 to 20 cache lines, right? Not loads, not touches of variables. 15 to 20 cache lines. It's quite big. Could be a lot more. So first lesson, you have to handle a lot more lines than like 8 or 12 or something. 20 for a random average hash map load. Wow. Um, you might get away with a dozen or fewer for very handcrafted, very carefully handcrafted use cases, but not for standard Java code. So it, it's just way more things. The map and the table and the entry and the key and the value and plus their V tables plus some reprobes with some extra entry keys plus whatever needs to run the key compare and whatever. It just goes on and on. But that's not what happened. Azul was good with that. We could handle all that and more. What really happened is that we died for true contention. That would be two threads touching the same cache line and one writes. And we had false sharing on the mod count field. So even if there's all readers plus only one writer and the writer's in an unrelated part of the table, that all worked. 
somebody updates the mod count and everyone dies. It's not just hash map, it's a lot of utilities had that effect in it. There was some sort of uh, common performance counter of some kind that was used especially to detect concurrent modification exception. And so as soon as a single writer came in, he aborted all the readers because they all looked at that value to see if there was a CME going on. But it didn't just fail once because the lock was busy and contended else your CAS was working and you just did it that way. So there were lots of readers contending and running through the lock and the rare writer. And the writer would come in, modify the, the mod count field and all the readers would abort. And then the writer would end up aborting because the readers had all looked at the mod count line as well. So the writer would retry, but the readers, there were so many, always a reader would get in first before the writer finished. And as soon as the reader comes in, he would abort the writer because the writer would touch the mod count, and the reader would touch the mod count, and the writer would get evicted. So it becomes a live lock situation where once one writer fails, all the readers prevent him from making forward progress. So the one writer spins, but the readers all bonk each other at the same, bonk the writer at the same time, and you just never made forward progress until you bail out to the OS. And then you failed to run concurrently, which was the goal in the first place. So it fails for true contention on the poster child case. Um, and in, in particular, it also failed just to get true parallelism in a broader general sense. So we knew we could hand roll a new hash map, and we did. And we could hand roll most of the JDK common library features that people would contend on, and we did. But that wasn't enough because that same kind of behavior showed up again and again and again. And so we didn't get true parallelism. And we had to be faster than an x86, or why would you bother? So in aggregate in a large box, we're much faster. But to do that, we had to have about 20 active working threads where an x86 needed to be only one in order to get that 5x boost of cost performance ratio. Why would you buy some weird ass startup from some weird ass companies, whatever, unless it was a hugely price performance benefit? Well, that was where we thought we had to be, but we didn't get there. Because the applications were not designed to scale well. There was no big scale thinking in the code at that era. These days, people talk scale, scale, scale all the time. You try hard to think about where the scaling goes. Back then, we were picking up legacy Java code and make it scale, and that did not work. We tried hard. The industry of that era was still trying to figure out the scaling model. And uh, there were many approaches, microservices being one. Azul tried the big parallel shared memory. And I claim if you put your head into that kind of shared memory, it works really damn well. Um, and I've done that myself personally many times since then. It does work very well. But it wouldn't work just without any thinking, because you have to have discipline to scale. And the discipline that you need to scale will work for both shared memory and distributed memory, but if you have no discipline at all here, it doesn't work. You somehow have to manage communication across your, your threading or your execution units, and that's either synchronization or software as a service or TCP sockets, whether it's microservices and HP2 or whatever the hell it is, right? Um, <clears throat> and once you do that, you don't need a big shared memory machine, much bigger than what you get off of an Intel box. Ultimately, it's just too hard to get four times the number of threads going to match performance of a single-threaded uh, x86. And industry pivoted to clusters like Hadoop, or various streaming models, or microservices. And it was cheap to organically grow these. You made one small, it was your desktop. And you debugged on your desktop, and you got it working. And then you went in production, and it sucked, so you fixed it a little bit. And then when it got busy and important, you added more and more services, and they sucked because they had weird cross interactions. And you fixed them one by one as you grew, because it was cheap to experiment with and cheap to make fixes that incrementally worked at the next level of performance. And clusters of cheap distributed x86s win the day, maybe because it's easier to incrementally scale them from a, a small to the large, even paying the engineering costs as you go. So about a quarter billion dollars were spent. The big machine had about 850 cores in it, roughly equal to 100 x86s of that era, but a complete shared memory space that everyone could touch at the same time. Lots of fun custom hardware, very aggressive hardware transactional memory, but it failed for what I would call sort of stupid reasons. Um, it would require a major software rewrite to use, which was defeated the purpose. So Azul did not sell highly scalable uh, sold highly scalable hardware on software that did not highly scale. 
Didn't work as a business model. But it lives on because oh, wait and see, GC totally worked, kicks butt even to this day. And, and uh, Oracle finally gave it up and is writing their own version of the Azul Collector. And they've got another, I don't know, I would claim five to 10 years before they get to where Azul is right now. Um, they're a ways off, but they're at least heading in the right direction. We told them how to do it a decade ago, and they just blew us off and grumbled around with CMS and G1. We, we, we totally put it in the open source and explained and talked and everything, and they were just like not paying any attention. I had stock back then. They, they, they bought out Azul. I'd have had some money. That's it. Q&A. Did you want to go ask any more? That was the question. We totally tried. Cash, yeah. Oh, oh, um, caches only hold a portion of memory. And then they, they um, to save on the bits in the cache that you have to compare for a correct address, you don't look at all the bits. So the every fourth bit shadows. Every fourth line shadows the same memory, or memory's fragment of four that shadows. So it, uh, things that land, unfortunately, um, will all try to share the same way in the cache, and up to four work. And on the fifth, he evicts the, the fourth, right? Uh, usually with a round robin eviction. Intel does an eight way, which has been considered generous for a long time, but it removes sort of the pothole effect where an unlucky layout fights over the same associative line. By the time you get to eight, that, that's extremely rare. At four, it can happen. For Azul, it happened a lot until we did stupid things like, what do they call it, random uh, uh, rainbow stack page coloring. You randomize your stack pages uh, uh, offsets so that they, they, every stack starts here, this one here, and this one's here, this one's here, a little bit different. And so your stacks would grow, and the same code would then get very hot in the same regions, and they'd migrate to the same stuff because they're all doing the same thing, but imagine this is 100 times in parallel. Well, if they're all landing in the same offsets from some fixed two megabyte base, then they land on the same cache lines and fight to death. So you page color a little bit, and that problem goes away. So I don't know if that was a question or not, but. Sorry, I saw on one slide that there was a point that you need uh, four x time more threads to support yeah. this thing, and I'm trying to understand why. <laughs> why? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, um, we didn't have Intel dollars for Intel level engineering, so the processors were done on a much cheaper scale. We were using two two generation old silicon generations with a much lower level of sort of big scale integration. Very few, transist very few transistors per core. Uh -huh. So the cores were slower in processor speed, and they were slower for not having the, the same kind of overlapping execution under the hood. They were, the original ones were uh, a strictly single at wide in order issue um, with a very short pipe um, so that a, you know, a, a jump, a, a mispredicted branch would cost you not that much compared to an x86, but the overall effect was about a quarter of the speed. And uh, I, 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 I don't remember the previous question, but uh, when the writers came to the, to the picture, picture, one writer, yeah, um, and all readers have to abort their cache, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so the sound quality is really bad. Sorry. <laughs> now, <clears throat> why, why uh, other readers should abort their cache when oh, one oh. writer came to the okay. came in. So, so they have a they have a common shared uh, piece of address they're touching. The writer writes mod count. The readers have all read mod count because the writer wrote a line a reader read. Somebody's wrong and shouldn't be in the lock. So the the uh, the the first person in aborts. And the second guy in, the writer, so, so the readers are all in and running. They've all read but not written. It's OK. The mod count field. A writer comes along. He touches mod count. He's the last one in. Everyone before him aborts because he demands exclusive access to that line to write it. So he demands it exclusive. Everyone else gives up their line. That means they would give up a line they've marked for transactions, so they must abort. So they all abort. Then they all retry. They all come in. One of them gets to the mod count field pretty quick and reads it. The writer who has modified it now must ship his modified version over to the reader to be correct. That means he has to evict his line. So the writer aborts. 
And then the writer comes back around, and there's 100 readers in there, so pretty soon he clobbers and the readers blow. So they, they take turns shooting each other down. But as far as I remember, modification count, mod count, yeah? Yeah, mod count, yeah. yeah. Why the hell reader needs that field? To check for CME. OK, what is, what is that? Can you explain? Yeah, concurrent modification exception. Ah, uh, OK. Ah, that's it. Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a very helpful thing that killed us. Yeah, exactly. What a stupid way to die. It, it wasn't the only death. It was a death for HashMap. And we fixed HashMap. And then we fixed, like, the next JDK utility, and the next, and the next, and the next. And it was still, there was always something somebody did that would be incorrectly touching for no good reason. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, the question is, why did you target mainly Java? Because a lot of other programming languages could oh, benefit money. from it. N none of the others commanded a ton of money. If I have to go out there and look at who makes money on what programming, who would pay money for a programming language, right? Facebook's got enough to engineer their own PHP variation, right? Google has multiple languages that are going to engineer themselves. Microsoft's going to engineer themselves. Who's going to be not a powerhouse in the programming industry who will pay for a better implementation of a programming language? Enough to support hardware. Uh, Java's an obvious one. You could say Python, but the Python crowd has you know, gone round and round. They don't want to see like a faster jitted Python. Or PyPy would be the new norm, and it's not. Right? I, I tried Python crew a decade ago and roundly got yawned at. I can make Python run 10x faster today, and no one cares. I care, but apparently the Python crowd didn't care enough, so fine. For me, it's kind of that not, not the trouble of uh, hardware, but that languages do not um, suppose this transactional memory uh, concept in their own. So. It, it, the, the transactional memory was an attempt to make Java locks efficient and in parallel. You could still have your single-threaded locking, your Java locking coding style, but also it would run fast in parallel. So, yeah, that was the goal. It seems that Java failed to run good on this hardware, the hardware that was not adapted well for the uh, Java itself. But it's just uh, looking at the same problem from the different perspective. Right. You know, in hindsight, looking back, there are ways to write Java code that would scale on this just marvelously well. It has nothing at all to do with locks and HTM. OK. Coming back to the stupid way to die, maybe the option was to rewrite uh, Java hash map? Was it? No, no I said we, we wrote hash map, totally. Okay. And, and then there was the next JDK utility. You had to, you know, link list hash map, and you had to next concurrent hash map, and the array list, okay, and this yeah. and that, and the next, yeah. the next, the next. Right. We did them all. And then there was user code that had the same kind of effects. So you can't just clear out one bottleneck, right? You have to clear them all out before you run in parallel. So, so you just go look at the next. Along the way, by the way, we built the most amazing, still to this day, high performance parallel profiling tools. So I could tell you, I could bring up an Azul box and tell you in you know, however many seconds it takes to get to your application going, where all your bottlenecks are and what, why they're there, all kinds of things about them, straight from my browser attached to an open web socket we put on the JVM itself, using the JVM's own internal runtime information that was used to decide to HTM or, or spin or block or whatever. So, so that's all available in an Azul box today and it should have been available in a freaking Oracle box a decade ago. Never mind, sorry, I'm, I'm whining at Oracle now. Yes. Hi, I have additional question related to JVM of Azul. Uh, how, when you compare the JVM to the Oracles, what are additional benefits, other benefits? Uh, that uh, so, okay, so, so the, Azul, the Azul JVM has uh, uh, reworked how the threading model works internal to the JVM. That gives us the ability to stop and start individual threads on a nanosecond scale, which in turn leads to the low latency GC that Azul is still way the hell better than Oracle's rewrite of all of the G rewrite as an, as an Azul GC. We, we explained in public how to write a collector that has a super low latency a decade ago, and I've given that talk half a dozen times. Randomly ignored by Oracle. They tried with CMS, they tried with G1, they're finally trying again, and they're now doing it what we've been telling them to do for a decade, and maybe they'll catch up after another decade. I don't know. They're, they're getting better, but they're, they're a ways off. So that's one of the things you get. Um, 
you, you get the profiler that has like all the cool things that the JVM already knows about everything brought out in a useful way. You get the ability to stop and start individual threads on a nanosecond scale means like bias locking is free to unlock, you know, to actually give up the lock on. Um, the, the latencies for everything drop like dramatically, and that turn brings the max pause for GC, but it's the max pause for the runtime for everything is in that range. And that's been picked up by everyone who's very latency sensitive. So Azul sells to high frequency traders all the time, for instance. Um, so basically, um, this was yet another attempt to let users write a classical uh, imperative sorry, code. The sound quality is very low. It's okay. nothing to do with is you. Is it better now? I can always hear echoes and echoes and echoes. Um, so better now? No? Carry Not on. Really. Okay, so that was yet another attempt to let users write a classical imperative code with locks, but you know, let it run faster, right? Yeah. And there are multiple attempts in history, right? The project Quasar with the fibers and you know a few other approaches. So I have a rather rhetorical question to you. What is your opinion? What is the silver bullet for that? So right. what is the answer? <laughs> right, right. So so the 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 the, the, the non-rhetorical answer here is we went where the money was at, so you had to go make Java and Java locks go fast. So that's that piece, but what's a better programming paradigm that's a parallel distributed scale out? I don't have that in my hand, and if I did, I would have jumped up and down and shouted it long ago. The thing I did at H2O um, led to a model that Sun is playing with now. I don't claim there's any heritage there. Uh, but there is a thing that looks a lot like continuation passing style matched with uh, an easy language for how you uh, define the start of a process by forking a task that's super lightweight and cheap. We're using an, an early version of fork join, um, but with some careful wrappers around where you gather things to block at. Um, in practice, it let me build a fairly complicated, fairly large distributed programming language for doing you know, big parallel math and have half a dozen systems engineers understand how it worked and code in it sort of on a regular basis pretty readily. And that built a model that mathematicians could write math code and we could auto parallel and auto scale it. So I claim there's a useful model there. I don't claim it's like the be all and end all by any means. Having said that, I've been screwing around with React and React Native and Elm, and uh, there's some goodness and light there. So I don't have the best answer. I don't know that there is a technically best answer anyhow, but I think there's something better than Java unlocks. What do you think about, what's your opinion about the reactive approach and the functional style programming? Uh, sorry, the v V8 or functional? Uh, reactive. Oh, reactive. Like regs Java, project React, yeah, or, yeah. you know, similar. So, yeah. So, so React does this thing where they um, they have a golden model that is stationary, and then they can display from it. And there's display code that doesn't touch the model but reads from it. Then there's people who mutate the model, but the mutators do an incremental independent clone, like Clojure does for every time you mutate a structure. They, 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 they pretend like they have their own copy that they can write to directly, but effectively they do a shallow copy and a mutation, so it's relatively cheap to do that copy. Then at some point they declare done, and they make this the new golden copy, and the, and the visual processing starts again. So for that model of execution where you have a, a golden wad of model state, and people make changes to it, one after another that are complicated, but you can stack them one after another and keep up, I think that's a very useful model. You're basically taking snapshots of your state machine at different points in the state history, and at each point you take a snapshot, you can now display. But you're taking a series of consistent snapshots, just like a Java takes save points. x86 processor has the same concept at that level, fucking you know, the world's quantum at that level. It's the same concept. Um, it doesn't scale if I need to do uh, uh, multiple guys updating in parallel on it because I, I, just I don't, can't keep up with single update. Right? If the single update's too slow, like, like I have a golden guy and somebody's making an update to it. Okay, 
the dude is making another, another request comes along. This one's in process. Do I let the new update start on this model? But then I fork my two big models. I can't do that. Does this guy start on this model? But this one's not done mutating. So do I let him optimistically start, hoping that he can make progress without getting aborted because this one finishes before this guy or something? That there's a thing going on there where after a bit, once you get one in direction, it comes free. The second one behind has to wait till the first one finishes, just like a lock. Or he has to abort or have some way to run in parallel. Um, so I don't know that that works beyond that state. So if I have a million of these things piling in at once, it won't, it won't work. You, you can't keep up. Whereas if I look at non-blocking hash map, I run it on, on a Zool box. Uh, it's, it is, in theory, perfectly linear scaling, and in practice, perfectly linear scaling up to the max cores I could get. Um, but it's a very different way of thinking about how the world works. It's how the hardware guys think about world. It's a truly a state machine all the way, and you're going to talk about it as state machine transitions. Once you get to that model, then you can handle a million things concurrently all at the same time, and it will all still make sense. But we don't have software tools that ever think about the world in that way. So I, you know, I don't know that's the right answer either, but I'll claim that that will scale the hell and gone. That, 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 no limits there. Um. So you mentioned that uh, Azul had, um, had a short and simple pipeline. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that uh, it is not affected, or at least uh, less affected, uh, to um, uh, mail, mail down and host attacks and that still play? Good okay, statistics? I can't hear you over all the echoes. So, so either talk louder in the mic or come up here, drop the mic, speak to me, and I'll echo what your your question is. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, you mentioned that uh, Azul had the, uh, it has a, has Azul a simple, has a shorter, simple and short, uh, simpler and shorter pipeline. Yes. Does it mean that it's less affected by uh, meltdown and host attacks? That, uh, oh, oh, oh! So can it be affected by like meltdown style at attacks um, and Spectre? Oh, that's interesting. Actually, yes. So the first Azul box would would technically not be acceptable. Uh, 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 tackled by those, affected by those attacks. The second Azul box allowed a, uh, a second hit under miss. So the, the first, um, the hit under miss means your cache has, you have missed in your cache, you're waiting for main memory. The first box would run on until you wanted to use the value you missed at or you issued any other load or store and then it would halt. The second one would allow any number of uh, loads or stores that were in your L1 cache while the first one was processing, but it wouldn't let two different cache misses run at the same time. And then, uh, oh, it didn't have any speculative unwind. We never had to deal with the case of you had a mispredicted branch that when failed, loaded, but that while it was trying to resolve, loaded the cache, then failed out later. So no, I don't think even to this day it would. But the consequence, of course, is four times slower than x86. There's, there's ways to do to prevent some of these spectrum meltdown attacks that I, I, I know people who are working on it. Um, you can expect processors who are resilient to it to be slower, but not 4x slower. I was dropping performance by by twenty percent. So yeah, there's some there are some easy bad fixes that went around, including things like turning off your cache, or turning off branch prediction. Where there's some there are some easy bad fixes. There are, there are better answers floating around. We're about out of time. Looks like we're about out of questions. Uh, declare done.